Today we're just so excited to have uh, Dr. Everett Worthington with us, who is uh, just such a, a nationally and internationally renowned expert on the issue of forgiveness and reconciliation. So let me just uh, quickly introduce Dr. Worthington because that's who we really want to listen to. So uh, Dr. Worthington is a licensed psychologist. He's a professor of psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University. His research includes areas on forgiveness, other virtues, religion, spirituality, uh, in clinical practice, and also uh, the hope-focused approach to counseling uh, couples. He's written uh, 30 books on a variety of topics, including forgiveness, uh, in particular uh, on his REACH model of forgiveness. Uh, he is really considered uh, the expert in these particular areas. So we are just so honored to have you here with us, Dr. Worthington. So join me in welcoming Dr. Worthington. Thanks. So I was in, uh, woo, I was in Philadelphia last week and uh, at a, preaching at a church and uh, they knew Tony Campola. And I remember seeing Tony Campola <clears throat> go, so nobody sits in the front row when I talk, you know, because I spit. So uh, I, I noticed that you all had gotten the word about me and, uh, you know. Well, I, uh, I want to talk with you today about forgiveness and about the way that it might relate to uh, justice and reconciliation. And I've got a kind of a subtext of this of, uh, you know, I'm coming at this obviously as a psychologist and thinking about how psychology might inform theology about this. So this is my mission, should I decide to accept it. So this is an old movie. I don't know if you've seen this movie. It's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, you need to get it on your Netflix uh, list. And, but uh, it's called The Mission, and it's actually a dramatization of a true story about Rodrigo Mendoza. And um, it's played, it, it's a cast of, you know, superstars, so it's got uh, De Niro, who plays actually Mendoza, and, and uh, it's got a, a number of Jeremy Irons, a number of folks that uh, we would all recognize. So it's a great movie. So what happens is Rodrigo Mendoza is a slave trader, and he goes off uh, up to the uh, top of the Iguazu Falls and raids a village quite reg regularly, and he brings back the children, the the braves, the uh, women, and sells them down in the lower lands as slaves. One time when he's off on a slave uh, mission, his um, brother has an affair with, with Rodrigo's lover. So when Rodrigo comes back, he challenges his brother to a fight, a knife fight to the death. Well, this is not going to be a fair fight because Rodrigo's brother is a lover, not a fighter. Rodrigo is a, a you know, a, a warrior. And so, of course, very quickly, Rodrigo kills his, his own brother. And then it's just overcome by uh, guilt and, and shame at what he's done. So he retreats into a mission and is just depressed and almost vegetatively. The priests are trying to get him over this. And so the way that they try to get him over this is one comes up with the idea of doing penance. And so his penance is to drag a hundred pounds of Spanish armor up the Iguazu Falls to that village that he's been raiding and there help build a mission uh, for them. And so there follows after that probably some of the 10 minutes of some of the most dramatic uh, cinema I think that I've seen where uh, Rodrigo is dragging this armor. He's 
totally getting beyond his capability of doing this. At one point, one of the priests gets really uh, compassionate and cuts him loose, but he's working his way through this penance, and he can't allow that, and so he just walks back down the falls and gets uh, the rope again and, and continues to drag it up. By the time he gets to the top, everybody else is at the top, and, uh, and he comes over the, the hill, and you can see him just barely able to walk, and he just kind of appears slowly, totally spent. He has no resources left within him, and he gets to the top, and he just falls to his knees crying because he knows this has not taken care of his sins. Well, one of the uh, braves, the natives, warriors, sees uh, him, recognizes who this is. This is the guy that's been stealing our men and our women and our children. He runs toward Mendoza. He grabs up a big knife on the way runs over to De Niro, to Mendoza, grabs his hair, pulls it back, and lays the knife alongside his juggler. And he looks to the chief for instruction. And there's this pause, and then the chief goes. And he cuts the rope, freeing this burden from... Rodrigo, and it swept down the falls and washed away. That which Rodrigo could not do on his own through penance, being forgiven, took care of his guilt. It's a fantastic movie. It, that's just kind of <laughs> the beginning. It goes on. I, I urge you to, to get it if you haven't seen it. Well, I'm going to look at forgiveness within the context of Christian formation. So how do we help people be more Christian Christians? And we know that there's a long tradition of Christian formation uh, throughout the, the history of the church, and that a lot of ways have been developed to to aid people in building Christian virtue into their life. We know, you know, from the book of James that basically this is a classical virtue theory uh, approach uh, to bringing virtue theory into Christianity, and a lot of people over the years have, have drawn on that, and a lot of verses uh, are encouraging us to build in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So, you know, how does this happen? Well, it happens in lots of ways. It happens because the Holy Spirit works within us and works on us to build in us, uh, you know, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And the Holy Spirit is going to work the way that the Holy Spirit works, which is sometimes unilaterally, just doing uh, the Holy Spirit's things, but sometimes working through other people and working through structures in the church and through ways that we have of, of uh, building a more Christian uh, uh, personality, a more virtuous personality. So a lot of this boils down to learning from examples, from exemplars. Uh, in fact, I, I wrote a uh, book that just came out this week, with uh, co-wrote with Scott Allison. So I think there's some uh, advertisements around, but it's called Heroic Humility. And uh, it's really about how we learn virtue from ex examples, so from heroic examples of humility or heroic examples of, of forgiveness. So, so we, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit works in lots of ways, uh, directly and indirectly, 
to build up uh, ourselves uh, in terms of uh, more Christ-like character. We have a part, of course. Our community has a part of helping us be more Christian Christians. Uh, but we also can learn uh, from a lot of different ways, including attending a seminary. Imagine that. That can form our character one way or the other, right? But, uh, so, uh, but uh, lots of different ways that uh, virtue is built within us. Now, of course, the way that we would like to have virtue built within us is, is like the matrix, right? How many people have seen the matrix? Okay, so in the matrix, you know, Neo, who is Keanu Reeves, is, is, uh, takes a pill that, that moves him out of a kind of computer fantasy world into the real world, and they find out that you know, he can learn things by just having, you know, it plugged into his mind and download all kinds of things into his mind. This is the way we would love to learn virtue, right? I mean, I'd love that, you know, just download the Bible for me, <laughs> you know, and, okay, or upload it, you know. So he learns all you know, 28 kinds of Kung Fu, you know, martial arts, and, you know, just instantly. That's what we would like. Unfortunately, that's not really the way it happens, except in the movies. And <clears throat> we have to form character uh, kind of the hard way. So <clears throat> I have some scenes here from some classic movies. You see Rocky at work there, right? Not how many times you get hit, it's how many times you get up, you know. And then we've got chariots of fire, and you know the people. Uh, <laughs> anyway, kind of had to be there, I guess. <clears throat> so what this is is it's kind of a Christian uh, uh, version of classical virtue theory. And basically what that says is that, that we start this process of building more Christ-likeness within us by glimpsing the goal that we want to get to. We don't really see it. We just glimpse it. We have no idea what the trail is going to take us through in order to get there. We just kind of visualize this is where I want to go. I want to be more forgiving. I want to be more humble. I want to be, you know, whatever Christian virtue. But then <clears throat> we begin to practice that virtue as well as we can understand it. And we, we practice until, then we try to practice as perfectly as we can until that virtue becomes a habit of the heart. It becomes something that's formed within us, and we have this different character formed within us. Now, the problem is, I can have a virtue formed within me, and I'm not sure if it's really in me. Like, imagine that I have practiced being courageous, but I've never really had it put to the test. And so, I have to experience various tests and trials you know, has any of you experienced various trials? You recognize this from James? You know, because those trials lead to character development. And so when I experience suffering and I experience temptations and trials and tests in my life, that allows me to prove the virtue that has been created within me, and it also allows me to practice in a, under stressful conditions. And if, if that's successful, then I end up, I think, usually being ultimately satisfied with my life. Not necessarily happy, because lots of things happen that, I'm, you know, happiness is not the way I would describe it. So if I am caring for aging parents, or as my 
wife and her family cared for her mother as she reached the end of her life, they would never have described what they were going through with her, with her dementia, as making them happy. But in the end, they were satisfied that they had done the right thing. And so this is like the end point of, of virtue. So this is just another way of seeing that with chariots of fire, you see glimpsing the goal and then practicing until this becomes <coughs> a habit of the heart. So we have karate kid here, wax on, wax off. You know, so he's practicing. He doesn't, doesn't even know that this is contributing. And then Rocky, who's practicing. <coughs> Meeting trials and temptations and then achieving some ultimate satisfaction. Well, <coughs> we've learned a lot uh, through the ages from just the way that the church has come to operate. So we've got 2,000 years of church history to, to draw on to tell us about how to become more Christian Christians. But now we also have, you know, psychology and, and other ways of, that might be able to contribute uh, some things. So in particular, there's this uh, part of psychology that, really sprang into existence about 1999 or 2000, that <clears throat> Marty Seligman and Mike Csikszentmihalyi uh, articulated. It's called positive psychology. It's positive psychology, about half of the people say, positive psychology is a psychology of happiness. I don't really like that as the way I look at psychology, you know, positive psychology. I, I think positive psychology is more about virtue. It's about building character strength or virtue. So psychologists, positive psychologists divide over this. So we, we have a controversy. And of course, we're going to solve, resolve controversies the way psychologists resolve controversies, which I'm sure you know how psychologists resolve controversies. They yell and cuss at each other, but, <coughs> but that's not the ideal way that we're going to resolve this. We're going to resolve this controversy by data. We're going to try to see, is positive psychology really more about pursuit of subjective well-being or happiness, or is it more about building character strength and virtue into the person? Well, it turns out there's been a lot of studies that have addressed this question absolutely straightforward. And don't get lost in the details there, <clears throat> but just look at the numbers. So co there's correlations, right? The correlations go from minus one, which is a perfect correlation with one thing increasing, the other thing decreasing, to plus one, where both are increasing together. So... <clears throat> A 1.0 correlation is a perfect correlation. There are none of those in nature. Most correlations in psychology are like 0 0.2, 0 0.3. This is called the personality correlation because that's what personality traits tend to be related to other things about 0.2 or 0.3. This gives you a sense of how big these correlations are. Now, look at these things that have given both measures of subjective well-being and measures of virtue and character strength. They are correlated like 0 0.79, 0 0.92. I don't know what, wherever I've seen 0 0.92. 0 0.96, my gosh, that's almost a perfect correlation. Basically, what we're finding from all of these studies is that in reality, the way that people respond to positive psychology is with happiness and with virtue and character strength. These things are so enmeshed with each other, it doesn't make any sense to, uh, to really separate them and to debate and fight and cuss each other like psychologists do. <coughs> 
Of course, we are human, and we are fallen, and therefore we won't stop, you know, arguing about this. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> so Francis Schaeffer, one of my uh, favorite guys, my uh, wife and I actually had the opportunity when I had just gotten out of the Navy back in 1978 to go over to Europe, and we spent two weeks, one at the beginning of the summer, one at the end, at Labrie in Switzerland, and we spent some time at Labrie in, in, uh, in England. And Francis Schaeffer, wonderful person. Uh, I don't know if anybody here ever had a chance to meet him, but he was amazing. So the first week we go to Labrie, and we go to a church service, and lo and behold, Francis Schaeffer is in town, and he's preaching. And so, well, in village, and he's preaching. So, so as we come out, he shakes my hand, and he goes, I, I don't think I know you. I'm Everett Worthington. This is my wife, Kirby, and I, you know we're traveling around Europe. Oh, it's really good to meet you. 13 or 14 weeks later, we come back, and we're coming out of the church service, and he goes, Ev, Kirby, how are you? I couldn't even remember my own wife's name 14 <laughs> weeks later, you know? My gosh, and here's this guy who met me once and shook my hands, and he's calling me by name. It was a, had a gift, a, a, a personal gift that was, went far beyond his apologetics, and, uh, you know, it just humanized it so much. Well, so psychology, I think, you know, so if we look at what he tells us, you know, Francis Schaeffer loved to say that, you know, God's general revelation tells us things about God, and God's special revelations tell us things about God. And, and we look, can learn from both of those. And so psychology is part of that general revelation. And so, you know, I think psychology can probably tell us things that theology hasn't addressed. And so <clears throat> that is what I'm going to look at in terms of what, what has psychology told us that might inform theology about ways to understand forgiveness that traditionally haven't been part of theology's uh, approach. So first of all, there are four kinds of forgiveness. So we have two kinds that psychologically we experience as being a, an offender or a wrongdoer. So one of those is divine forgiveness, the way that God forgives us. And our psychological experience of that is I'm a wrongdoer, by grace, by mercy, I receive, you know, Jesus, and, and I am forgiven of, of my sins. We also have self-forgiveness. So self-forgiveness, of course, is not in the scriptures at all. It doesn't mention self-forgiveness in the scripture. It mentions self-condemnation a lot, right? I mean, it's kind of a major theme of, you know, that we do do things wrong and we do condemn ourselves. And, so I want you to think about David and his interactions, right? So he's had an affair with Bathsheba, and he's caused Uriah to be killed by sending him to the front and then pulling the troops back. So he's got some serious wrongdoing here. And you remember Nathan comes to him and confronts him, right? And tells him the story about the little lamb, and then... And then David says, that man deserves to die, but being a merciful king, you know, I would say repay four times over, right? And what did Nathan say? You are the man. David immediately is like, I have sinned against God and man. And Nathan says immediately, as God's prophet, what? You are forgiven. God has forgiven David. Now we come to Psalm 51, which it says, Psalm 51, a psalm of David after Nathan has confronted David. So read that little preface there. 
And what do we see in Psalm 51? Create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore a right spirit within me. You know, purge me with hyssop. Cast me not away from thy presence. We have self-condemnation. David has been forgiven by God morally, but that doesn't take away the social consequences, right? Because Nathan said, David, you've been forgiven by God, but there's going to be consequences. It doesn't take away the psychological consequences. I mean, David was a basket case from then on, I think, uh, psychologically. So there is room for self-forgiveness that we can see from psychology that is not just, you know, revealed in Scripture explicitly. So, <clears throat> so two kinds of forgiveness. One, divine forgiveness. Another, self-forgiveness. Now, there are two other kinds of forgiveness that are about uh, more a psychological experience of having been offended, having been hurt, having been victimized in some way. One of those is person-to-person -person forgiveness. So person-to-person -person forgiveness is somebody has done something to hurt me and I forgive them. The second is, is complicated because it's a societal level of forgiveness. So societal or social forgiveness is about what happens when someone with the power to do so makes a statement that our group forgives someone or some other group. Okay, so you have a social or societal forgiveness. Now, I mean, that can be problematic, right? Because in my group, there are all these hot-headed radicals that don't agree with that forgiveness. And so they may act out in violence against this group even though forgiveness has been pronounced by this leader who has the power to do so. Let's say Bill Clinton forgiving you know, uh, somebody or asking forgiveness of the Japanese for imprisoning you know, folks during World War II. So, <clears throat> or isolating them during World War II. So, so there are problems dealing with violations of the treaty, if you will. Does this make sense? That you've got the leader that says we forgive, but then you've got these violent acts that are happening. Now, I just might say, that's not any more complicated than me as an individual forgiving someone, and then they end up violating that trust again and again and again. And I have to decide in both cases how much violation is going to invalidate the treaty, basically. So we got four kinds of forgiveness. So I want to zero in on person-to-person -person forgiveness because that's what psychology has looked at for the most, and, you know, and also self-forgiveness is, is really um, blowing up. So the way that psychologists understand this is that forgiveness happens inside our skin. Transgressions happen in a social context. Reconciliation happens in a social context. But forgiveness happens inside my skin. Now, when I say to you, I forgive you, okay, that is a social act. That's not forgiveness. Does that make sense? Because couldn't I say to you, I forgive you, and you say, thank you so much, and you turn your back, I stab you right in the back because I didn't really forgive you inside my skin, but I find it convenient to throw you off to tell you that I forgive you. So what I say is not necessarily forgiveness. So forgiveness happens inside our skin. Forgiveness is really hard. It's person-to-person -person forgiveness. 
This is a, a picture of my family uh, when I was younger, when we were younger. That's my brother and my sister, and I'm the, uh, I'm the stud muffin in the military uniform there. <clears throat> well, I know forgiveness is hard because I have experienced things that challenge me, that test me, that put me under trial, that create suffering. One of those is that my, my mother was murdered on a New Year's night of uh, 1996. And <clears throat> it was a young man who saw a darkened house because my mom had gone to bed early and, my, uh, and she, had, she didn't drive, so there was no car. And so he assumed, probably, that he was just going to waltz in before midnight these people are gone to a New Year's party. I'm going to steal everything that is of value, and I will be long gone before midnight. Well, as it turns out, that, uh, that didn't happen. But my mom was asleep. She woke up as he was searching the house, and he ended up with a crowbar bludgeoning her to death. So, and he you know, compounded the wrongs by then violating her with a wine bottle that he had as she lay bleeding to death on the carpet. So these, these were difficult things, but my brother and my sister and I all were able to forgive really quite quickly because my mother had taught us to forgive. Now people would say to me, how can you forgive something like that with your mom? And I would say, how can I not? That's exactly what she taught us. It would be dishonoring to her not to do what she taught us to do. And my brother, sister, and I all, uh, you know, arrived at the same conclusion independently of each other. <clears throat> well, stories like this never end, of course. And my brother, 10 years later, was still suffering post-traumatic stress disorder because he had been the one that walked in and discovered mom's body and saw all the blood and everything. And so <clears throat> he, my brother, you know, was having these problems and, and he was uh, very depressed over this traumatic image that kept intruding in his life. And he was talking with me, we were having dinner together once when I was down in Knoxville, Tennessee visiting, and, uh, <clears throat> and he said... Uh, or I said to him, Mike, you know, if you're still having problems after 10 years, you, you need to, to get some psychological help. And Mike said, I'm not going to any shrink. This probably tells you something about our relationship, okay? <laughs> that he would say that to his shrink brother, you know? But uh, I persisted, and I said, you know, Mike, if, you, uh, if you've had 10 years of this, and, you, you know, it's not going to get better if you don't do something different. You need to get some counseling. And he looks at me. He's really angry, his lips trembling. He's shaking his finger at me. He goes, I'm not going to uh, go to any damn shrink, and I don't want to hear any more about it. Now, I was a clinical psychologist right? I've been counseling folks for 50 years and dealing with all kinds of resistances. And so the mature psychologist that I am, I responded just like a 15-year-old teenager. You know, I'm like, well, whatever. <laughs> and I didn't bring it up again. Within three months, he committed suicide. So then... I had a lot of self-condemnation because I knew I did not act in a way that I knew how to act. So <clears throat> I had to deal with self-forgiveness, and it took me much longer to deal with self-forgiveness than it did to deal with forgiveness of uh, uh, the, man, the young boy who killed my, my mom. In fact, you know, I, I, I did have a crisis in faith over this. You know, I really didn't realize it, but I had gotten cold toward God. And I was out at a conference 
one January, it was about like three years later, and a, there was a psychoanalyst speaking, which is from Australia. Uh, her name's Maureen Minor, and uh, this, uh, she gives a talk, and then we go back to the hotel, and we're going up the elevator, and Maureen says, so Ev, I understand that your, your brother committed suicide. How, how are things going with you? And I said, fine. Okay, now, so just a word to the wise. If you're in an elevator with a psychoanalyst, <laughs> and she asks you a very emotionally loaded question, saying fine is not the right response, okay? Because her response back was, really? <laughs> now, she was a lot more subtle than that, but, uh, but basically, she kind of challenges me to go on, and then she just didn't say anything. And so I'm standing there going, oh shoot, this is not working out the way I planned. <laughs> and finally I start talking, and as I started talking and kind of pouring out what I was thinking and feeling, I could almost have this out-of-body experience in which I'm looking at myself going, that guy's bitter toward God. And I, after that conversation, went back to my room and just, you know, prayed, Lord, you know, I can't, I can't do this. I need to restore my relationship with you. And so I know that forgiving other people and forgiving yourself, that both of those are very hard. Well, let me talk about, wait, how long do we have? 1.30? Okay, so let me talk about uh, the way that we understand forgiveness. And I'm going to do that by introducing this idea of an injustice gap. So injustice gap is the difference between the way I would like to see an issue resolved and the way that I see it right now. Okay, so a big sense of injustice is hard to deal with, right? Small injustice gap, easy to deal with. You bump into somebody on the street. At the time you get to the end of the street, you've forgotten that they kind of seemed aggressive when they bumped into you, right? But big things, hard to deal with. Now, what we do is we end up uh, keeping track and adjusting the size of this injustice gap as things happen in our life. So let me give you an example of this. I was, uh, <clears throat> was scheduled to teach, uh, to start a new semester, and I taught Psych 101, 305 inquiring minds want to know. Okay, well, it turns out that on the day, the first day of class, which is August in Richmond, which is 100 degrees, on the first day of class, I get subpoenaed to go testify uh, as a character witness, honest, for this guy that had done a crime. And now I have to tell you, I like coffee. In fact, I get up at 5 or 5.30 every morning, and before I go to work, I drink a pot of coffee. <laughs> and then when I get to work, I drink coffee pretty seriously. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. So, <clears throat> so uh, I drink my coffee, 7.30, and I go over to the court building, and uh, I sit, and I wait, and I wait, and I wait, and it gets to be 12 o'clock, and 1 o'clock, and 2 o'clock. I've got to teach at 3.30. It gets to be 2.45, and finally they call me. I go in, they swear me in, Set me down. What do you think of this guy? Oh, he's a good guy. You may go. All of that, you know. So I, I run out, and I run to my car, and, you know, it's like 10 minutes till 3, and I've got to teach at 3.30, and I'm 8 miles away from campus on, you know, city streets. 
and I'm driving down like a crazy guy. Well, of course, there are no parking places any place near VCU. It's an urban campus, and so I end up parking a mile away. I jerk my backpack out. You know, I've got my backpack. It weighs like 50 pounds. I jerk it out. I put it on. I'm in my suit. Right? And I am running down the street trying to get to my office to pick up my flash drive. And suddenly it dawns on me I have not had any coffee since 7 30 this morning. And to show you the depth of my pathology, I deviate off of the street <laughs> and go two blocks over to a Starbucks where I get a venti coffee, you know, and now I'm running down in 100 degree weather in my suit with my backpack, drinking hot coffee, you know, wiping myself, sweating like a pig. I get to my office, I grab my flash drive, I run another half mile across campus, and at exactly 3.30, I step up on the stage in front of 305 uh, inquiring minds. And I proceeded to give the best lecture in the history of Western civilization. <laughs> It was amazing, you know, but I could tell because like the people were not praying like they usually do when I lecture. You know, I look out at these Psych 101, they're all praying. Well, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's prayer. And, or they're looking up statistics on their Facebook account, you know. I, anyway, they weren't doing that. They're, they're like hanging on my every word and they're, you know, nudging each other and getting, encouraging each other to pay attention. I'm on my A game and I'm like striding around and I'm telling stories and I'm jumping up and down. And at exactly an hour and 15 minutes, I finish with a dramatic example and stop and I release them. And suddenly about a hundred of them jump to their feet and start to rush the stage. And I'm like, having fantasies. You've seen my fantasy already. Oops. There's my fantasy. I thought that they're going to like pick me up on their shoulders and carry me out to the VCU campus and erect like a statue in my honor. But the first woman who gets to me goes, uh, Professor, do you realize that you have something on your forehead? And I, I reach up, and sure enough, it was a big piece of napkin about that big around that had been sticking to my forehead for an hour and 15 minutes. And when I touched it, it floated down, and a hundred people turned and rushed the exit. So, students today, Whoops. Students today do not come to class unarmed. They had cell phones. And about three days later, there appears on YouTube the amazing napkin face professor. <laughs> okay. Now, one of my colleagues thought that it would be a really stunning idea to share that link with all of the faculty. <laughs> now, I had an injustice gap against this guy, right? It's like this. Now, what if I had gone to him and said, you know, it hurt my feelings when you shared that link publicly. What if he had said, life is full of little disappointments, isn't it? <laughs> All right, here was my injustice gap before. What is it now? It's yes, like this, right? In other words, I'm adjusting this. That's easy for you all to say, but not for me, apparently. I'm adjusting this injustice gap as I go along. But what if I'd said, you know, it hurt my feelings when you shared that, and he said, Oh my gosh, I didn't realize he starts crying, he falls down on his knees. I'm like, this is good, justice is happening here, right? And so, you know, and then he says, what can I do to make this up? Can I give you a million dollars? I'm like, well, take some of the edge off, I guess, you know, or clean your toilets for the rest of my adult life. And I'm like, okie dokie, I'm there then, we can, we can deal with this. So, 
Uh, the point is, I am adjusting this injustice gap continually. And the bigger that gap, the harder it is to deal with. Now, we have a lot of options. As Christians, we often think, oh, I've got to forgive that injustice. No, not really. You know, there are many options for dealing with injustice gaps. Some are better than others. So one is successful revenge. Hello. My name is Enrico Montoya. You killed my father. You deserve to die. Or, has anybody seen Taken by Liam Neeson? Okay, his daughter is kidnapped, and she has a phone with her, and, you know, and when she's carried off, the phone's there, and so the kidnapper picks it up, and Liam Neeson, who's a, kind of a bad uh, uh, CIA-type operative, you know, he, he goes through this monologue. He says, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want, but if it's money you want, I don't have any. But what I do have is a particular set of skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you give up my daughter right now, nothing will happen. Everything will be over. If you don't, I will find you, and I will kill you. And he proceeds to do that, you know, because <laughs> he, he is the star. So revenge is a wonderful way to get rid of my injustice gap. So it's an absolutely stunning, perfect way. It, it has social consequences, of course, <laughs> in that I feel my pain more than I feel your pain. So if I think you hurt me with two units of pain, you probably think that you hurt me with one unit of pain. So I feel like, well, I've got to get even with you. I've got to give you something that you'll feel is two, and so I give you two, but I don't feel your pain as much as you do. You feel like it takes, it, it was three. And now you're like, wait a minute. I hurt him one, he gave me back three, I owe him. You see, so there's this social fallout from this. Well, there are a lot of other ways to uh, deal with injustices that are biblical such as seeing justice done, such as turning it over to God. Here's turning it over to God for divine justice. God's finger is hovering over the smite button. He's going to you know, correct this for me with divine justice. Or there's turning it over to God just in relinquishing it to God. Yes, I give it over to you, God. There's forbearance. So this is a, you know, forbearance is a, a biblical uh, concept. There is acceptance and moving on. I'm just, this life is too short for this. I'm moving on. But then there's also forgiveness. So what is forgiveness? Well, I think there are two different kinds of forgiveness. These are not two halves of forgiveness. They're two different experiences. One of these is a decision to forgive. It is a decision to, it's, a, it's an intention statement saying, I intend to act differently toward this person in the future. I am not going to get even with them, and I am going to treat them as a valued and valuable person. This is decisional forgiveness. Now, we can experience decisional forgiveness make that decision, treat the person as a valued and valuable person for the next 50 years, and every time we think of them, we get emotionally upset and resentful and bitter toward them. And that suggests that we have emotional unforgiveness of resentment and bitterness and hostility, anger, hatred, and fear. Therefore, there there has to be a second kind of forgiveness, and this is emotional forgiveness. Emotional forgiveness is replacing negative, unforgiving emotions, which I just named, with positive, other-oriented emotions toward this person. Emotions such as empathy and understanding this person. As I told you about forgiving the young man who killed my mom, you could see I'm 
I'm trying to put myself in his place. What is he like? Why did he do this? Why did he hit her? Well, because he thought this is going to be a perfect crime. She's spoiling his perfect crime. She's looking at his face. He's afraid he's going to jail. So as I get into his mind with empathy, then that allows me to see that, you know, I, I understand this guy. Now, earlier that night, I had stood in a room with my brother and sister and pointed to a baseball bat and said, I wish whoever did that were here. I didn't say it that calmly. I would take that bat and beat his brains out. I can now see this young man that he had these motives, he had these experiences. And I flashed back that night to myself and I thought, wait a minute, whose heart is darker here? Is it the young man who out of fear that he's going to jail and anger that his crime has been spoiled and low impulse control? Is he worse, worse than me, who was a mature believer who had written a book by that time on forgiveness, who's willing to point at a bat and say, I wish I could have him here. I would take that bat and hit him in the head like he hit my mom in the head. After having a day to think about it, I thought my heart is darker than his heart. And yet I knew I could be forgiven. And I thought, if I can be forgiven for the darkness in my heart, who am I to hold unforgiveness against this young man, and I was able to forgive. So these other oriented emotions, like empathy or sympathy for the person, or compassion for the person, or love for the person, help us to forgive. Now that's helped, it's facilitated by other emotions, such as being grateful that we've been forgiven, or by humility, or hope. So let me just make sure that you understand that forgiveness is two things. Decisional forgiveness, different from emotional forgiveness, and it's not the same thing as reconciliation. Reconciliation is restoring trust in a relationship. That's a social act. Forgiveness is internal. I cannot grant reconciliation to someone because if they don't want to be trustworthy, we're not going to reconcile. It would be dangerous for me to put myself in their hands if they are just going to kill me if they see me. So I can't, you know, I, so reconciliation is different and in a different realm altogether than emotional forgiveness or decisional forgiveness. Notice also that forgiveness is also not the same thing as saying, I forgive you. That's a social act. That's in the realm of reconciliation. So here's this woman who says, well, of course I forgive you, and she's going to stab him. So two types of forgiveness in Scripture divine forgiveness and human-human forgiveness. And we also know that there are two types of human-to-human -human forgiveness, decisional forgiveness, which I believe is what Jesus requires of us. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then two verses later, for if you do not forgive... Your the something that's you know transgressing against you, your Father in heaven won't forgive you. But if you do forgive, your Father in heaven will forgive you. Not talking about salvation, right? Because that would put salvation under our control, and we know that's not true. It's probably talking about that great white throne of judgment where the believer's acts are judged and burned up as straw or hay or stubble, or refined into precious metals. So decisional forgiveness is, I believe, what Jesus requires of us because we can forgive every time we are offended. How many times do I have to forgive, says, Paul, uh, says uh, Peter? 
seven, not seven, but 77, or 70 times seven, or infinitely every time you have to forgive because you can make a decision, no matter how hard it is, about how you are going to act toward this person and how you're going to treat that person. But you can't control your emotions like that. So emotional forgiveness is what God desires for us. But we can't always have that because the person may continue to hurt us. Paul says, as much as it is up to you, live at peace with all people. But it isn't always up to us because the other person is not willing to do that. It's going to keep it raw and keep my emotions stirred up. So what did psychology bring to the table here? You know, well, we began with the injustice gap. There are many things that can be done to deal with injustices that are biblical things. And there are two types of forgiveness, decisional and emotional, and they're different from each other. And forgiveness is not equal to reconciliation. So I'm, I'm looking, I've got a massive amount more, another two or three hours. I'm sure you have plenty of time for this. But uh, I think what I want to do is skip some things. Pardon this. I know this is always frustrating for folks. So, so scripture, you know, tells us we should forgive. But it, it doesn't really tell us how. It's more like, well, just do it. So the, the Nike approach. <laughs> just do it, you know. Uh, it doesn't tell us how. So psychologists have helped us learn how to forgive. And so I've developed this five-step method to reach forgiveness. R, recall the hurt. Now think back to my story and how I went through and tried to recall the hurt, but not just recall what a jerk that boy was for killing my mom, but to recall it while empathizing with, with him. And if I can't work up an empathy, maybe sympathizing and feeling sorry that he would get to the place that he got to. A, give an altruistic gift, a gift that that person does not deserve. They don't deserve forgiveness. I give this as a gift. It is a gift. Then commit to the experience that you've had internally commit to yourself, in front of yourself. Maybe you write yourself a contract uh, that, you know, today I forgave so-and-so. Or maybe you do some kind of ritual act like write the offense on a piece of paper and burn it up or put it at the cross, you know. And then finally, H, the reason we commit is so that we can hold on to that unforgiveness when we doubt. Now, in case you're a... Uh, you know, intending to be a preacher or a pastor and, you know, and teach uh, in churches, I have created a uh, resource to help people teach and preach about forgiveness. It's got a, a lot of practical stuff in it. I'm hoping to turn it into a book. Um, but it's on my website as a huge, huge amount of free stuff is on my website. Let me give you my address. It's, of course, www, then it's just Ev Worthington, E-V-W-O-R-T-H-I-N-G-T-O-N, dash or hyphen forgiveness dot com. Ev Worthington, hyphen forgiveness dot com. Workbooks on how to work through unforgiveness. Workbooks to build humility, to build patience in your life, to forgive yourself. All of these are free, downloadable, Word documents. Want to lead a group in Reach Forgiveness? I've got your basic two-hour group. I've got your basic seven-hour group. I've got your basic 20 hours of exercises. You choose what you want to do. Want to work with couples in forgiving? Free, you know, uh, way of, of uh, dealing with couples. So if that you know, is of use to you, you know, you're free to just download those however you want. What can pastors do to promote forgiveness in local congregations? There are lots of things pastors can do. First thing is, 
brace yourself for this, it's probably going to be heresy. You can't really expect to produce much forgiveness with a sermon because there is a strong dose-response relationship between how long people try to forgive and how much they forgive. Now, if you preach a really good sermon on forgiveness, and I've heard some really good ones, then some people will come up and tell you you have changed their life, and you probably have. All those people who went to sleep while you were preaching will not come up and confess that to you. So on the average, you don't get much average change from preaching. Therefore, what should you intend to do with preaching? Well, you know, you're trying to first motivate people to seek out ways that they can spend time forgiving. Now, you can motivate people very quickly. You're not having a direct effect, but they're going to get the effect because of the motivation. Another thing that you could do is you could examine the benefits to forgiving. Science has just identified huge physical health benefits. We did an edited book of 30-some-odd chapters of all of these scientists that are reviewing the area of forgiveness and health, in particular health uh, areas. It's a huge. It's over a 1,000 studies that support that forgiveness is better for your health. Forgiveness is better for your mental health. Forgiveness is better for your relationships. Forgiveness is better for your spiritual life. Now, just appealing to a person like this, you shouldn't hold the grudge because it will make you sick. It will damage your physical health, your mental health, your relationships, your spiritual life if you hold the grudge. Give up the unforgiveness for your own sake. This is no different than saying God wants you in the kingdom of God Give yourself to God for your own sake. So, you know, you can say to them that and you will get an immediate amount of forgiveness by appealing to forgive for your own sake. You will get more when you go through those reach forgiveness steps and you appeal to them to forgive so that you can bless the other person with that altruistic gift of forgiveness. You get much more, ironically, by helping the other person than helping yourself. But it's helpful to help yourself. And then there's lots of models that you could show. Uh, there's the five-second forgiveness fix. You know, every, uh, every week, say something like this. Christians are a forgiving person, people. So let's, let's forgive. Move on. Say it week after week after week, five seconds, and, you know, it will make a, a difference. Okay, what I'm going to do, uh, here's a, another thing. You could organize within a church a campaign to promote forgiveness. Now, we have just gotten accepted recently a study on the campus of... Um, Luther College, that is a community-wide study to promote forgiveness in a college campus. We tested 800 of their 2,600 students repeatedly, okay? And we followed them before we did the campaign and then a campaign that involved the community and then afterwards and basically big amounts of forgiveness for just raising people's awareness. Well, there are many things. I wish I had a lot of time to talk about this. Personal counseling, you know, can help. But what I want to do is, is to stop here and give you about seven minutes to ask whatever questions that you have. And uh, I'll be up here afterwards if you have other questions that you can't ask. Questions? Thank you. Um, yeah, th thank you for uh, that. 
Um, so we, you talked about a lot about um, individual, basically individual hurt. Um, my, maybe this is a totally different um, subject, so maybe it's for some, some other things. But then just you know, curious, how do you then deal with um, the social injustice and um, when you do not have um, you know, particular like, you know, the, uh, offender um, that you could easily forgive? It's um, against, let's say, some uh, group of people, society, or you know, like even it could be racial, you know, people. How how can I know that it's a little different? But then maybe just can you help? Well, the how way the, the way that we treat that is that the way that I get to a place where I say I can't forgive these people is usually a generalization because I've had an experience with this person, and I've had an experience with this person. And I've had an experience with this person, and at some point I go, I don't like those people, right? And so, so we coach people who are struggling with that to think of what's the worst injustice you've ever experienced at the hands of this uh, person specifically, or these, these people. And they come up with a particular case, and they work to forgive that. What's the next worst? and they forgive that, and then the next worst. And in working through, they're going to be able to generalize in the same way that they generalize up into unforgiveness, they generalize into you know, more forgiveness. You know, people have prejudices that are you know, beyond just discrete instance of forgiveness, and so you're also dealing with prejudice and not just uh, uh, forgiveness of a social injustice. But there, remember, there are many ways to deal with injustices. So besides working on forgiveness, I want to work for social justice. You know, I want to accomplish positive things in society. And, um, and so that helps me to, uh, you know, to rectify the, in, the social injustice as well as forgive my personal response to it. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Worthington. I'm, I'm not quite sure how I'll articulate this. My name is Ella, and I'm a MAKO student here. Um, when you feel in your heart that you have forgiven someone a what I would call a great injustice, and you sincerely believe that uh, as a Christian, um, how, could, uh, how could you help that person, or me in this case, avoid what I would call hyper-vigilance. Um, do you know what I'm asking? I do know what okay. you're yeah. So being really alert that they might hurt you again. Yeah, or being really critical, silently critical, um, and hyper-vigilant. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that we separate out, you know, forgiveness and reconciliation. And so in some cases, it's, it's very appropriate not to reconcile. You know, if the reason I think I'm vigilant is because I'm pretty sure they're going to hurt me because they just can't control their negative tongue or whatever it is. And so, you know, I might want to limit my social contacts with them because that is something that just protects the whole community. You know, it's not just protecting me. It's like protecting them from sinning. It's protecting other people who get the fallout of this. So I think that, that that's one uh, thing that I can do. Uh, the other thing is, is just to say, to myself, you know, I'm not supposed to forget that I've been hurt. God made us so that we remember that we've been hurt. But we remember it differently when we've forgiven than we remembered it before. So, you know, and the reason is because if, if I don't pay attention to the fact that, I, that I'm liable to get hurt again and again, I'm probably not going to survive, you know, that they'll, they'll get me. 
and so anything that's dangerous, we are hardwired to be careful until trust has been established. So I have to wait until that person shows himself or herself of being trustworthy before I'm willing to establish that trust. So I don't want to, you know, if I'm in that situation, I don't want to feel guilty about the way that I'm feeling. That's the way that God designed us to feel. And I want to do all I can to protect myself or to promote the trust by myself being trustworthy, you know, and, and being careful about the situations that I get in.